Dr. Richard Rhodes, current uh, president of Austin Community College. Dr. Stephen Kinslow, uh, former president of Austin Community College. Uh, we're uh, here to talk about uh, ACC in general, but more about the Highland Campus and uh, the fantastic things that are happening here mm -hmm. and uh, what, what it looks to both of you like uh, in the, into, the, into the future, to the extent that you, you know, are able to, to, to see very far into the future. You guys are both uh, visionaries and, 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 uh, and I, I expect that you have some thoughts about uh, where, we're, where we're going. <laughs> And so I want to talk about that. Actually, I want you guys to talk about that uh, uh, with me so that we can maybe understand a little bit better uh, how we got to this point, particularly again here at uh, Highland and, uh, and, and where we're going. Um, now, Steve, you, you, uh, you started at ACC in 1977 right. and did a, a number of uh, different very important tasks he here. And then in uh, 20, oh, two, oh, 2005, mm -hmm. became president, mm -hmm. and um, at, you were right on the on the on the edge of uh, the acquisition of this this property uh, for a campus, yeah. and uh, you you were president until 2011, mm -hmm. and Dr. Rhodes, you f you picked up at that point, right. and uh, are. Uh, escorting us through the present toward uh, toward right. toward the future. Right. Now, what I want to start with is uh, how in the world uh, a college comes to buy a shopping mall for a campus. Where did the vision for that come from, and what were the circumstances mm -hmm. that allowed it to happen? Okay. Um, it was a very complicated purchase of the mall. Uh, first of all, it started with a lot of different moving pieces. This really was a process of about uh, four years from the time that we got serious about looking at acquisition of the mall and then had purchased uh, the anchor stores and the land that the mall uh, sits on. But it was over the years a number of people would look at Highland and think, gosh, you know, look at all the space there as the mall was declining. You know, there was a lot happening around a shift in the way people thought of retail and malls were becoming less popular. Now some of them are kind of coming back. But um, there was a lot of um, decline in Highland Mall. And so, you know, ACC's main theme for uh, the first 30 years really was coping with rapid growth and then co uh, trying to cope with finding or developing our facilities and you know before we had a tax base it was all leased and borrowed space none of which was very good and then we would outgrow it and then most of the uh, leased properties that we had really were not very conducive to supporting the development of workforce programs and uh, specifically some of the newer ones that were really in high demand and so over time you know ACC got a tax base a very modest one and then uh, later a few years later was able to increase that from five cents to nine cents and over that period of years too we were working to develop annexations to bring more school districts uh, in one because of uh, high demand from their communities but also bringing what ACC could offer at a better value to them and so as those things were happening the college was able to start building its own facilities like Northridge and Riverside and um, the South Austin campus but we were still obviously a modest college in terms of finances and so we built simple buildings that were nice but simple and much smaller you know when you go to other uh, community colleges and look at classrooms they were much larger than ACC classrooms labs were bigger all of those things and so we still always were dealing with that um, issue of rapid growth and continuing to get control of our facilities destiny at least and so um, back in 2007 uh, we commissioned a group uh, to start developing um, master plans for each individual college so that the college could get on a longer range kind of planning cycle around deferred maintenance issues, renovations, and, and plan for growth more um, 
purposefully than sometimes had been the case just because of the circumstances. Um, and so um, one of the things that came out of that study was you need a lot of work done <laughs> on your campuses, <laughs> a lot of deferred maintenance issues just from high yeah. usage and uh, that ACC had the smallest ratio of square footage on its right. facilities to students uh, in the state. And um, that of course got smaller and smaller as the enrollments went up and up. And so one of the recommendations was also to plan for future renovations and expansions and uh, when the college purchased property, trying to purchase more uh, for future development of things. And then uh, at the same time, there was the issue of uh, the district administrative offices and they were overcrowded. In fact, uh, they were now in two locations, the service center and uh, across uh, adjacent to this mall, the administrative office. So in uh, fall of 2008, the board um, authorized um, us to uh, look at available properties and, um, that would be suitable for combining, uh, reconsolidating uh, all of the district functions. And so that is where the first contact really came about this mall. And it was uh, anonymous uh, at first. You know, people represent properties, but they won't tell you the right. specific name or location as they're first exploring that. And so um, we were very interested in what was happening with the old Austin Airport and the redevelopment plans for Mueller. Uh, and this whole concept of um, new urbanism was uh, really taking hold nationally about taking um, areas that uh, were in decline and uh, bringing in the right mixture of public and private and business and residential and, and denser kinds of uh, properties. And so uh, one property that the college was exploring was in Mueller and was very interested in, but for Mueller, you can't buy the property. Uh, they will only lease, do long-term leases. And uh, the administration and the board were very set, oh, we want to own all of our own facilities and really have control over what happens with those. Um, and then the other property was the contact around uh, a 200,000 square foot building that uh, would allow us to consolidate. And over time, it became obvious that it was the uh, Dillard's building in uh, the mall. And so that really kind of planted the seed about there's a, a door opening here that maybe this mall can be looked at. And so around the same time, then some key players kind of emerged. It was very fortuitous. Um, all of this, uh, really, I think uh, the glue to this working was really uh, Bill Mullane, who's uh, at that time was Associate Vice President for Facilities and Operations. And Bill's still here, just really great guy. And um, the person that had been representing the anonymous property that turned out to be Dillard's was uh, Jay Haley, very well known and respected local realtor. And um, then we had uh, begun and continued discussions with um, Matt Whelan from Catellus, which and Catellus was the uh, developer doing the major work for the Mueller redevelopment. And long story short, uh, Matt ended up leaving Catellus and forming Redleaf. And so um, we went back to the board and said, you know, we, we think we need to look at the bigger picture of maybe uh, designing a pathway to get uh, all of the mall. So the goal was to secure it all. And that really came about from the board's um, very wise decision that we don't want to buy Dillard's and consolidate all of the district administrative functions and then nothing happens to the mall or we don't have any control of what happens. And so you could end up with ACC sitting in a concrete, you know, wasteland. Of, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that um, led, you know, to the board's support of let's try to buy the whole thing. <clears throat> and then if I'm talking too much, I can stop. There's You're some. great. So um, there were, again, a lot of complexities to this. So um, the way Highland Mall 
um, operated was each of the anchor stores, which was uh, Dillard's, which had two stores by that time, and Macy's and J.C. Penney's owned their buildings but leased the land on which the building sat. And so there were three different anchor owners there. Um, AIG owned the uh, site that the right. mall sits on. And then there were some lawsuits going on uh, for different things. And then there was also the issue that the mall con was continuing uh, to basically dry up and tenants were leaving for um, a lot of it was going up north to the domain development. And so um, around that time then, uh, we went ahead and put in the, the bid to get Dillard's and that closed in uh, fall of 2010, I think. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we formed the development partnership with Redleaf to explore getting all of the other properties. So the Foley store followed and that closed in May of 2011. And then in 2012, the Penny's purchase closed. So we had that and then um, sometime in 2011 or 12, we secured the purchase of the mall site. There was still a lot to do, obviously. We had a lot of, <laughs> lot of property, but <laughs> more than we needed yeah, for the yeah. first time in the history of the college. <laughs> so. Was anybody aware of, the, I'm sure that you, you were, uh, but, but uh, wondering if any people were aware of the, uh, the history of this area, particularly in terms of education? Not really. Uh -huh. uh, you know, that came in pieces over time as well from working with the community. You know, yeah. The board was always very intent that everything we did here would involve the community and, and complement the community. Um, and uh, so a lot of the neighborhood associations uh, participated very actively, and that's where we started learning more about the the history of it. And I think you actually know more about the history of it uh, than I probably. But. And, well, it is, it, is, it is a fascinating one and uh, the, it's all, it, 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 I think it's, it's, it, you can look at this as the uh, fulfillment of a foreshadowing. Uh, the St. John Baptist Association mm -hmm. had mm -hmm. built an orphanage and an industrial school right. uh, just really across uh, Huntland. Uh, from 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 the, where where we're sitting right, right now, and um, th that uh, th that pro that began uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, the, the buildings were main building was constructed mm -hmm. and uh, finished in 19, 19, uh, 1906, I think something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the interesting thing to me is, is that uh, although that that that, that enterprise uh, ultimately uh, failed, um, members of the African American community in the St. St. John's area were interested, and there was one, uh, at least one um, bu uh, African American businessman who tried to fulfill the the, the desire for even a. A junior college on mm -hmm. this uh, on, on this location uh, that didn't happen until the purchase of, uh, of, of the property. Yeah. You know, as Steve was talking, I, I, I can kind of picture Steve sitting up in the president's office and <laughs> back in those those days and looking out of his window, which <laughs> overlooks the mall, mm -hmm. and over a period of years, seeing the decline of the mall mm -hmm. and. See, watching the anchor stores disappear, and then begin to see some graffiti <laughs> up here and mm -hmm. some other mm -hmm. types of activity that you you would right. want to see happen. Right, right. And saying, you know, and visiting with the board and saying somebody's got to do something about this, mm -hmm. and uh, nobody was stepping up. And and we had, you know, really a, a board that was very engaged about wanting to do this. They they became very excited about it and. Uh, even over the years, at different times, there were board members individually that would say, wouldn't it be neat if the college could get that? And there were faculty and staff that said it too. So, you know, I'm not sure where the, the one real thing um, ignited other than this confluence of things around 2008 started happening kind of fortuitously, the, the thing of uh, forming the partnership with Redleaf and um, 
pursuing the, a very systematic approach to getting um, the mall and the properties, but that, that entailed close to a three year period to get all right. of that done. But and it, you know, it, I, I think <coughs> it went faster than anybody thought it, it would. Did. It did. Um, you know, the last purchase, uh, when I got here in 2011, I think all of the buildings were already owned, mm -hmm. but it was the land underneath mm -hmm. that That's hadn't been finalized. Mm -hmm. And so we, we had the opportunity to move forward. One of, the, one of the issues was, I think there were still 70 small businesses <laughs> in operation. Yes. Yes. Some had longer term leases than others. Right. Uh, right. Some were almost on a day to day. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But some had, you know, multi year leases. And right. so to, to try to work through that and how do you purchase the property and, mm -hmm. and how do you uh, deal with the existing leases right. uh, was, was of concern. But I think probably, you know, if, if you go back and look, probably the college ended up purchasing and uh, being able to develop probably three to five years ahead of schedule. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, right, so very exciting. And also, you know, I think it was nice that as the mall continued to further decline, you know, as the anchor stores were closed, the smaller businesses that had leases, many of them actually wanted to get out. And I know right. uh, the college under you and also a few of them um, before I left, we offered to buy their leases out or release them from the obligation of those leases rather than um, you know, trying to minimize the transition for those, right. those folks. Because um, you know, everybody was, was very concerned about how are they going to continue to operate. Right. And, um, and then after I left, I know you did uh, some really interesting things with um, this site in terms of a veteran affairs office, um, increasing the size of the accelerator Right. which was really uh, a great decision. And, um, you know, I'm sure there are other things, you know, many things changed from the original concept because there were so many more opportunities with this space and so many different kinds of partnership possibilities. So. One of the things we knew was that uh, we were gonna have to go back to the voters uh, for a <coughs> geo-bond election. And to do that, uh, we wanted to have a proof of concept, and so we decided to focus on pennies first uh, and instructional space, and then to, prior to the election, to be able to bring people from the community into the space and, and kind of participate in the vision mm -hmm. and see what the possibilities uh, were for the future of Highland. And so we kind of, we use pennies as a proof of concept. Uh, and. We also wanted to use it as an opportunity to, you know, Steve was talking about with uh, explosive growth of the institution over the years, basically building uh, campuses to maximize, get as many students in there as possible. Uh, and what we wanted to do here was, was take a look at um, congregating spaces for students in between classes and also to take a, a look at uh, one issue, one area that we were having trouble with, and that is students being successful in developmental math. Mm -hmm. And so, how could we change the delivery of developmental math to help students be more successful? And uh, so, we, our math faculty, um, visited different institutions around the country, uh, including Virginia Tech University, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which had uh, a reputation for their uh, learning labs large open learning lab and uh, they visited University of Alabama and some other institutions and the math faculty came back and said for ACC I think this is what we need mm -hmm. and so this was really designed um, at the request of our math faculty and what they thought needed to happen differently. Mm -hmm. And that was reflecting some of the trends nationally around this more intense focus on student success and identifying uh, research-based best practices. So it was it was um, one of the few times I think where ACC actually had enough space yes. to, <laughs> to, to really do it right. Yeah. You know, so that was great. Yeah. So. And and if you you know when you uh, visited this while it was still J.C. Penney's or you know it was after they had vacated it. And you walk in here, and there was no natural lighting uh, anywhere in here. Yeah, <laughs> it was just, just a, a cave, World War II bunker. Yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, it, it was ugly. Yeah. And I remember uh, I had uh, uh, just started and I walked in here and they had just kind of uh, torn out everything and it was just solid concrete all around. And I, I thought, um, why, have, why has Steve left me? <laughs> what have I gotten into here? <laughs> this, uh, this is going to be a chore. <laughs> An exciting challenge. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was great. The architects, uh, BGK, just did an awesome job of, you know, um, putting in a skylight, a huge skylight, opening up, you know, uh, lots of natural lighting throughout the space. Yes. And exterior improvements yes. too that, that make it not look like an old mall as it's being developed. And uh, Before I left um, in August of 2011, when you mentioned uh, BGK made me think again. So BGK of course had developed those campus, individual campus master plans. And then after we purchased Dillard's, uh, we extended their contract to also include developing a master plan for that redevelopment, which migrated really to J.C. Penney's uh, right. as the better location for doing all of this. And then um, shortly thereafter in 2010, I guess probably in the fall of 2010, the board then adopted um, a district-wide facilities master plan that took all of those BGK individual campus master plans rolled in the district service center master plans put them all together and then um, also made reference to needing to start thinking about the future uh, bond election and so I figured that was a great time for me to leave <laughs> 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 and they did a great job on the bond election. Yeah. So you might want to talk a little bit about getting the bond election, yeah. which I'll really gave a huge infusion of money. So. This guy created the, the platform and the foundation <coughs> uh, for us to launch uh, that, that bond issue. Um, the great work that he, that he did in building up to it uh, made the job much easier for me. Um, but it was, it, you know, it was a combination of things. Um, you know, when you, when you go to a taxing district uh, as large as we have, and with as, the numbers of campuses uh, that we have, then you've got to make sure that uh, you're inclusive of uh, looking at the needs uh, more than just Highland. Uh, Highland was a focus, a focal point though, because it's 1.2 million square feet and 81 acres that needed to be developed. Uh, and so uh, what we did with this, with the pennies, is we used revenue bonds uh, to go ahead and, and do the renovations. So it's, it's really the students who uh, were paying for that over a period of years, like a mortgage, um, through fees, uh, building use fees. Um, but th I think that was, this was a critical, the development of this was a critical juncture mm -hmm. for the success of the bond issue because the community really rallied around mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. revitalization of Highland, right. uh, the redevelopment. And once they could see this space, um, it was like, wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and the other uh, beauty out of the bond election too, I think, was again that all of the campuses had their master plans finally, right. so everybody could see something that was going to improve their local campus in a significant way. And then one of the selling points around all of that too was that as the campuses would start getting the, the heavy renovations that were needed, particularly like at Rio Grande campus, um, there was alternative space for them because again ACC could not afford to taking Rio Grande as an example say okay we're not going to need those million plus uh, state reimbursed contact hours to do this and then there was the flip of that of course being look at all the people that would be delayed right. in getting what they need on their educational path and so um, being able to talk about that in the bond campaign I think y'all did a beautiful job of uh, really making people understand this is all very synchronistic. It's very right. interrelated and very well planned. 
Well, it's almost extraordinary to the extent to which the, 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 this whole project has, uh, has won the support of the, of the, the neighborhood. Uh, it doesn't always, doesn't things right. like this don't happen <laughs> yeah. that way right. all the time. Right. They're excited. One thing that uh, Steve and I both graduated from the same doctoral program, um, you know, sometimes people call it the, the presidential uh, doctoral program. Um, but, but the one thing that, you know, I look back upon our experiences in that program and Nobody told us we were going to be developers, <laughs> right. property developers. Right, I don't remember the course on that. Yeah. <laughs> and so to see, you know, see the result, which is a planned mixed-use community, uh, urbanization, is um, is phenomenal. And you know, we just opened up the, uh, in collaboration with Redleaf, uh, the first set of apartments, uh, 309 apartment units. Wow. 10% of which are affordable uh, units, but it's great. opening those up and then seeing, you know, the master plan for the site and the amount of green space that will replace, you know, asphalt parking lots right, throughout. Right, right. Uh -huh. And walkable access to uh, yeah. the red line, which is, it is really it's ideal. nice as well. So. It is ideal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, is, is, you think this is a, just a unique, a unique situation, or is there are, are there are there elements in this that, that could that others other community colleges could uh, could you know could embrace and adopt for? We're the we're averaging. Um, <coughs> matter of fact, during <coughs> South by Southwest, we had we hosted um, some some attendees to come and visit the accelerator. And at least two or three of those that were in the South by Southwest visitation are already in the process of looking at purchasing a mall uh, <laughs> like this. That's great. Uh, and then we had a group from Canada come down specifically to take a look at what is happening here mm -hmm. and what can they take back uh, mm -hmm. to do the same thing. Uh, so it's, we're averaging probably two to three visits a week now. Uh, of people coming down, not not that they're going to buy malls, but they're excited about the redevelopment collaboration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what's uh, w w w phase two is is underway, but getting cl close to completion now? I guess is that right? Well, it'll be complete in 2020. 2020, Thanks, so we still yeah. have a while. So we're close. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Closer every day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's four major programmatic areas will be uh, established there. Uh, you know, we'll have um, uh, a workforce innovation center. Uh, one of one of the and Steve talked about this for. You know, for advanced manufacturing, robotics, and some of those types of uh, career and technical training programs, we don't have space on any of our campuses to deliver that type. And so, in order to deliver advanced manufacturing training, we basically have had to do it on site of employers uh, of major industries such as Samsung. Um, and what we really needed is a space to allow that to happen, but wide open, flexible space that we can bring the, the right type of equipment in and take mm -hmm. it out and, and mm -hmm. continue to, to renovate. Our, and uh, so that'll be one of them. The other is digital and creative media. And we always think about uh, gaming technology kind of as, as something to visualize. It's gaming technology brings in the technology aspects of cool. computer programming and, mm -hmm. and motion graphics and things like that, but mm -hmm. it also infuses the arts. Yes. And so it's, yes. a, it's a combination of music, <coughs> visual arts, uh, dance, drama, mm -hmm. and infusing that into uh, digital and creative media. And so the spaces here mm -hmm. for that mm -hmm. uh, are going to be phenomenal. Hospitality, management, culinary arts um, is also going to be here. We'll have a state of the art. Uh, kitchens, pastry kitchens, a restaurant that'll be open to the public, but managed by students. Mm -hmm. um, and and my kind of my goal is also to have a microbrewery <laughs> <laughs> attached to it. I, I like that idea. <laughs> I knew you would. That's great. <laughs> 
and uh, and then also a uh, simulation center for the health sciences uh, will be here. So uh, this is a uh, uh, fulfillment of uh, stem to steam, yeah. right? Can you explain what what that transit, what that, what, the, what those acronyms mean? Yeah. Well, of course, we've always talked about STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, and trying to, to get more students um, who are majoring in those, those areas. But what had been left out is the arts. Uh, and so STEAM became the infusion of arts into mm -hmm. the technologies and the sciences and, uh, and engineering. And, and so what, you know, what this has allowed us to do, too, is to create some unique uh, models that, that we hadn't really uh, conceptualized before, um, such as the, the biotech incubator. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, we have a great biotech program. You know, uh, Linnea Fletcher has just been mm -hmm. awesome mm -hmm. in the development of that program. Uh, but then there's, there's really no wet lab space, uh, not enough in the area for mm -hmm. our students to get some experience on, but also for those that are developing product before it goes to market uh, in a wet lab environment to have that opportunity. And so um, through collaboration with the governor's office uh, under Governor Perry, we were able to, able to get uh, almost $5 million to create wet lab space, which is the creation of the biotech incubator. Uh, and that was probably something that I had, I would have never guessed would happen. <laughs> but uh, very unique for ACC uh, in that, you know, it's the, ACC is the only community college to get funding from uh, the governor's office uh, for that purpose. And uh, that fund no longer exists, <laughs> so we'll be the only yeah. <laughs> ever. <laughs> yeah, but thank goodness you got it. So, yeah. yeah, but it's a great opportunity for students to get some experience, hands-on experience. Uh, you know, because ACC provides a, a fantastic, um, you know, delivery of education, but oftentimes the you know, what's missing when they go out to find it, when the students go out mm -hmm. to get a job is, tell me about your experience. Uh, and so how does that relationship, mm -hmm. the relevance come mm -hmm. forth? Right. And again, the beauty is this space and this location allows the college really uh, the ability to respond really well. And community colleges, of course, are frequently the very first responders to emerging new technologies when you were talking about Gaming, you know, gaming right. started um, by um, uh, through continuing education originally, and then it became a series right. of uh, non-credit courses, and then as that industry took, you know, grew roots in Austin, then it morphed into an associate degree program as well, and uh, that's what community colleges do, and so the resources now. Um, for ACC and again also having more financial stability than it had in its first half of its uh, existence is it's really nice to see I mean it's such a maturation of uh, what I still believe is the most important resource in Central Texas is Austin Community College. That, that's something that's really fascinating to me what you just said about the, the community colleges being early responders to demands for and just kind of the drift mm -hmm. toward uh, mm -hmm. high, you know high, it's high tech uh, yes. pr programs um, that, that that's that's a feather in our in yeah. our, our caps really isn't it? and there's many many examples of that yeah mm -hmm. um, commercial art towards digital right. art right. and uh, uh, what started as drafting you know uh, is not drafting <laughs> right. Right. anymore by any means because of uh, technology changes and also an infusion of the arts into mm -hmm. uh, what happens in that field. And then, of course, um, you know, I'm excited to hear about the demonstration space for um, uh, health sciences. You know, right. um, ACC has uh, what traditionally has been the best nursing program in the state of Texas, and then. We were able to expand it when Round Rock came into the district and double it, and ACC still produces the vast majority of healthcare workers, and especially nurses. And so 
Um, that field, of course, has changed, and I think you're pursuing or are already right. approved uh, to offer the baccalaureate level of nursing, right. which is also uh, a real feather in the cap of college. Well, we're almost there. All right. We, uh, we have the, uh, the approval of the Texas Board of Nursing. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, our application is at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, and it's also at uh, SACS. Yeah, that's uh, great. So, for approval. So. Yeah, that's wonderful. So we're excited about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, at my advanced age, I'm uh, I'm, I'm visiting uh, uh, medical you know pe people <laughs> more <laughs> more often than I ever have, and, and you're and you're right. I mean, the, the every time I go into a, 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 a physician's office or you know the dentist's office, or whatever, I, I I ask where the technicians got yeah, their training, and it's right yeah, here. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yep. You know, and we've got uh, 11 early college high schools today, mm -hmm. and we've got three innovative academies, and more and more of those will develop. And, and you know, that speaks to the partnership between the ACC, community colleges, and K-12 institutions. Mm -hmm. But we also have co-enrollment programs with the um, University of Texas at Austin that started four years ago uh, to make sure that students um, who are in the top, that one is for top 10% students, but those that can't get into UT. Mm -hmm. They've got a pathway through ACC uh, mm -hmm. to get, um, to make sure that they uh, have admission status there. And so uh, they get that through going through the PACE program. Uh, and then a year later, Texas State program started up and they're actually taking their classes on the, in the Hayes campus. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, just this past year, we started a program in engineering with uh, Texas A&M University, mm -hmm. which is, I know for us as UT, you know, that was <laughs> yeah. kind of hard. Make know. an exception. That was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good for our students, I think. Absolutely. Um, but that is, you know, they, they can stay here and take their first two years and get their uh, associate degree in pre-engineering. And the great thing about that is in, in a lot of programs such as engineering, a student can get an associate degree and then transfer to a university but still have four more years right? Uh, because of the sequencing of courses. Right. In the co-enrollment program with uh, Texas a and University, those pr courses are already sequenced mm -hmm. in the first two years. Mm -hmm. uh, and Texas A&M is actually teaching one course per semester to that cohort of students right mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. at Highland Campus. Well, Dr. Rhodes, you're steering the ship. Uh, Steve, you're... <laughs> I'm the luxury passenger. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you, you're uh, doing some serious consulting with other community colleges mm -hmm. who are in the process or anticipate being in the process of selecting uh, Chancellors and presidents. Yeah. And so I work with. Do boards. you draw on this experience? I mean, you must. Oh, absolutely. It's very helpful. And what I love about it is it lets me uh, still have a finger in the pie, so to speak, because I will always be, you know, uh, passionate about community colleges. So that's that's great. But yes, I think it it helps uh, these kinds of experiences um, to. Uh, broaden the ability to look at other colleges and know what they're doing and through their strategic plans help find the right mm -hmm. mix of talent because that's really what it always boils down to you know um, we're bl I've always said you know the reputation of the college or of any college really rests on the faculty and staff and what a good job they're doing and so you know ACC right. has always been blessed with a really great faculty and staff but it also requires the mix of uh, leadership that can see opportunities and boards that um, uh, have good relationships with their CEOs to uh, also bring many things, their connections, their partnerships into play in these things uh, helps a lot. And so it's very eclectic, but it's all it all comes together. And I think, again, this is just such a great example of how a lot of things came together. And so much of this, again, was the fortuitous thing of having the right people. Bill Mullane, uh, Neil Vickers, who's still here, right. and uh, really you know, you couldn't have had a better person working on the financial pieces of this and right. understanding all that. 
And then the external partners, you know, Matt Whelan and um, Jay Haley and right. uh, Steve Matthews was involved in all of that. And it was right. just a great synergy between everybody to get focused on a common vision and the vision kept growing and expanding as, as more of the pieces fell in place. It'd be like, oh my gosh, now look what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? Yeah, so, so it's been really nice.